Welcome to Bedtime Scaries. Have you ever wandered leisurely down a staircase, only to be startled by the sudden jolt of the stairs ending a step later than you thought? The panic, the confusion, that quickly dissipates into self-deprecating laughter at your mistake. Tonight, we will explore that sensation extending on and on and on for eternity in The Tower by Marganita Lansky. The road begins to rise in a series of gentle curves, passing through pleasing groves of olives and vines. Five kilometers on the left is the Fork of Florence. To the right may be seen the Tower of Sacrifice, 470 steps, built in 1535 by Niccolo di Fermano. Superstitious fear left the tower intact when in 1549 the surrounding village was completely destroyed. Triumphantly, Caroline lifted her finger from the fine italic type. There was nothing to mar the success of this afternoon. Not only had she taken the car out alone for the first time, driving unerringly on the right-hand side of the road, but what she had achieved was not a simple drive, but a cultural excursion. She had taken the Italian guidebook Neville was always urging on her, and hesitantly, haltingly, she had managed to piece out enough of the language to choose a route that took in four well-thought-of frescoes, two universally admired campaniles, and one wooden crucifix on a village church, quite a long way from the main road. It was not, after all, such a bad thing that the British Council meeting had kept Neville in Florence. True, he was certain to know all about the campaniles and frescoes, but there was just a chance that he hadn't discovered the crucifix. And how gratifying if she could at last have something of her own to contribute to his constantly accumulating hoard of culture. But could she still add more? There was at least another hour of daylight, and it wouldn't take more than 35 minutes to get back to the flat in Florence. Perhaps there would just be time to add this tower to her dutiful collection. What was it called? She bent to the guidebook again, carefully tracing the text with her finger to be sure that she was translating it correctly, word by word. But this time, her finger stopped abruptly at the name of Niccolo di Fermano. There had risen in her mind a picture, no, not a picture, a portrait, of a thin white face with deep-set black eyes that stared intently into hers. Why a portrait? she asked, and then she remembered. It had been about three months ago, just after they were married, when Neville had first brought her to Florence. He himself had already lived there for two years, and during that time had been at least as concerned to accumulate Tuscan culture for himself as to disseminate English culture to the Italians. What more natural that he should wish to share, perhaps even show off, his discoveries to his young wife. Caroline had come out to Italy with the idea that when she had worked through one or two galleries and made a few trips, say to Assisi and Siena, she would have done her duty as a British council wife and could then settle down to examining the Florentine shops, which everyone told her were too marvelous for words. But Neville had been contemptuous of her program. You can see this stuff in galleries at any time, he had said, but I'd like you to start with the pieces the ordinary tourist doesn't see. And, of course, Caroline couldn't possibly let herself be classed as an ordinary tourist. She had been proud to accompany Neville to castles and palaces privately owned, to which his work gave him entry, and there to gaze with what she hoped was pleasure on the undiscovered Raphael, the Titian that hung on the same wall ever since it was painted, the Giotto fresco under which the family had originally commissioned it still said their prayers. It had been on one of these pilgrimages that she had first seen the face of the young man with the black eyes. They had made the long, slow drive over the narrow, ill-made roads, and at last had come to a castle on the top of the hill. The family was, to Neville's disappointment, away, but the housekeeper remembered him and led him to a long gallery lined with five centuries of family portraits. Though she could not have admitted it, even to herself, Caroline had become almost anesthetized to Italian art. Dutifully, she had followed her Neville along the gallery, listening politely while, in his light, well-bred voice, 
he had told her intimate anecdotes of history, and involuntarily she had let her eyes wander around the room, glancing anywhere but at the particular portrait of Neville's immediate dissertation. It was thus that her eye was caught by a face on the other side of the room, and forgetting what was due to politeness, she had caught her husband's arm and demanded, Neville, who is that girl over there? But he was pleased with her. He said, Ah, I'm glad you picked that one out. It's generally thought to be the best thing in the collection. A Boronzino, of course. And they went over to look at it. The picture was painted in rich, pale colors. A green curtain, a blue dress, a young face with calm brown eyes, the plates of honey gold hair. Caroline read out the name under the picture. Giovanna de Formano, 1531 to 1549. That was the year the village was destroyed, she remembered, now sitting in the car by the roadside. But then she had exclaimed, Oh, Neville! She was only 18 when she died. They married young in those days, Neville commented, and Caroline said in surprise, Oh, was she married? It had been the radiantly virginal character of the face that had caught at her inattention. Yes, she was married, Neville answered and added, Look at the portrait beside her. It's Bordenzino again. What do you think of it? And this was when Caroline had seen the pale young man. There was no clear light colors in this picture. There was only the whiteness of the face, the blackness of the eyes, the hair, the clothes, and the glint of gold letters in the pile of books on which the young man rested his hand. And underneath the picture was written, Portrait of an Unknown Gentleman. Do you mean he's her husband? Caroline asked. Surely they'd know if he was, instead of calling him an unknown gentleman. He is Niccolo de Fermano, all right, said Neville. I've seen another portrait of him somewhere, and it's not a face one would forget. But, he added reluctantly, because he hated to admit ignorance. There's apparently some queer scandal about him, and though they don't turn his picture out, they won't even mention his name. Last time I was here, the old count himself took me through the gallery. I asked him about little Giovanna and her husband. He laughed uneasily. Mind you, my Italian was far from perfect at the time, but it was horribly clear that I shouldn't have asked. But what did they say? Caroline demanded. I tried to remember, said Neville. For some reason, it stuck in my mind. He said either she was lost or she was damned. But which word it was, I can never be sure. The portrait of Niccolo, he just ignored altogether. What was wrong with Niccolo, I wonder, mused Caroline. And Neville answered, I don't know, but I can guess. Do you notice the lettering on those books up there under his hand? It's all in Hebrew or Arabic. Undoubtedly, the unmentionable Niccolo dabbled in black magic. Caroline shivered. I don't like him, she said. Let's look at Giovanna again. And they had moved back to the first portrait, and Neville had said casually, Do you know... She's rather like you. I've just got time to look at the tower, Caroline now said it loud. And she put the guidebook back in the pigeonhole under the dashboard and drove carefully along the gentle curves until she came to a fork of Florence on the left. On the top of the little hill to the right stood a tall, round tower. There was no other building in sight. In a land where every available piece of ground is cultivated, there was no cultivated ground around this tower. On the left was the fork for Florence. On the right, a rough track led up to the top of the hill. Caroline knew that she wanted to take the fork to the left, to Florence and home and Neville, and said a sudden urgent voice inside her for safety. This voice so much shocked her that she got out of the car and began to trudge up the dusty track towards the tower. After all, I may not come this way again, she argued. It seems silly to miss the chance of seeing it when I've already got a reason for being interested. I'm only just going to have a quick look. And she glanced at the setting sun, telling herself that she would indeed have to be quick if she were to get back to Florence before dark. And now she had climbed the hill 
and was standing in front of the tower. It was built of narrow red bricks, and only thin slits pierced its surface, right up to the top where Caroline could see some kind of narrow platform encircling it. Before her was an arched doorway. I'm just going to have a quick look, she assured herself again, and then she walked in. She was in an empty room with a low arched ceiling, and a narrow stone staircase clung to the wall and circled around the room, disappearing through the hole in the ceiling. There ought to be a wonderful view at the top, said Caroline firmly to herself, and she laid her hand on the rusty rail and started to climb, and as she climbed, she counted. Thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, she said, and with the forty-first step she came through the ceiling and saw over her head, far, far above, the deep blue evening sky. A small circle of blue framed in a narrow shaft round which the narrow staircase spiraled. There was no inner wall, only the rusting railing protecting the climber on the inside. Eighty-three, eighty-four, counted Caroline. The sky above her was losing its color, and she wondered why the narrow slit windows in the wall had all been so placed that they spiraled around the staircase too high for anyone climbing it to see through them. It is getting dark very quickly, said Caroline at the 150th step. I know what the tower is like now. It would be much more sensible to give up and go home. At the 269th step, her hand moving forward on the railing met only empty space. For an interminable second, she shivered, pressing back to the hard brick on the other side. Then, hesitantly, she groped forward, upwards, and, at last, two fingers met the rusty rail again. And again, she climbed. But now the breaks in the rail became more and more frequent. Sometimes she had to climb several steps with her shoulder pressed tightly to the brick wall before her surging hand could find the tenuous, rusty comfort again. At the 375th step, the rail, as the moving hand clutched it, crumpled away from under her fingers. I'd better just go by the wall, she told herself, and now her left hand traced the rough brick as she climbed up and up. 422, 423, counted Caroline with part of her brain. I really ought to go down now, said another part. I wish, oh, I want to go down now, but she could not. It'll be so silly to give up, she told herself, desperately trying to rationalize what drove her on. Just because one's afraid, and then she had to stifle that thought too. There was nothing left in her brain but the steadily mounting tally of the steps. 470, said Caroline aloud with explosive relief. And then she stopped abruptly because the steps had stopped too. There was nothing ahead but a piece of broken railing barring her way and the sky drained now of all its color still some 20 feet above her head. But how idiotic, she said to the air. The whole thing's absolutely pointless. And then the fingers of the left hand exploring a wall beside her meant not brick, but wood. She turned to see what it was and there in the wall level with the top step was a small wooden door. So it does go somewhere after all, she said, and fumbled with the rusty handle. The door pushed open and she stepped through. She was on a narrow stone platform about a yard wide. It seemed to encircle the tower. The platform sloped downwards away from the tower, and its stones were smooth and very shiny. And this was all she noticed before she looked beyond the stones and down. She was immeasurably, unbelievably high and alone. And the ground below was a world away. It was not credible, not possible that she should be so far from the ground. All her being was suddenly absorbed in the single impulse to hurl herself from the sloping platform. I cannot go down any other way, she said, and then she heard what she said and stepped back, frenzied, clutching the soft, rotten wood of the doorway with hands sodden with sweat. There is no other way, said a voice in her brain. There is no other way. This is vertigo, said Caroline. 
I've only just got to close my eyes and keep still for a moment, and it, it, it'll pass off. It's bound to pass off. I've never had it before, but I know what this is, and it's vertigo. She closed her eyes and kept very still, and felt the cold sweat running down her body. I should be all right now, she said at last, and carefully she stepped back through the doorway onto the 470th step, and pulled the door shut before her. She looked up at the sky, swiftly darkening with night. Then, for the first time, she looked down to the shaft in the tower, down to the narrow and protected staircase spiraling round and round and round and disappearing into the dark. She said, she screamed, I can't go down. She stood still on the top step, staring downwards, and slowly the last light faded from the tower. She could not move. It was not possible that she should dare go down step by step, down the unprotected stairs into the dark below. It would be much easier to fall, said the voice in her head, to take one step to the left and fall and would all be over. You cannot climb down. She began to cry, shuddering with the pain of her sobs. It could not be true that she had brought herself to this peril, that there could be no safety for her and that she would climb down the menacing stairs. The reality must be that she was safe at home with Neville. But this was the reality, and here were the stairs. At last she stopped crying and said, Now I shall go down. One, she counted, and her right hand, tearing at the brick wall, she moved first one and then the other foot down to the second step. Two, she counted, and then she thought of the depth below her and stood still, stupefied with terror. The stone beneath her feet and the brick against her hand were two frail protections for her exposed body. They could not save her from the voice that repeated that it would be easier to fall. Abruptly, she sat down on the step. Two, she counted again, and spreading both her hands tightly against the step on either side of her, she swung her body off the second step and down onto the third. Three, she counted and then four, and then five, pressing close and close into the wall away from the empty drop on the other side. At the 21st step, she said, I think I can do it now. She slid her hand up the rough wall and slowly stood upright. Then with the other hand, she reached for the railing. It was too dark to see, but it was not there. For timeless time, she stood there knowing nothing but fear. Twenty-one, she said. Twenty-one? Over and over again, but she could not step onto the twenty-second stair. Something brushed her face. She knew it was a bat, not a hand that had touched her. But still, it was horror beyond conceivable horror. And it was this horror without any sense of moving from dread to safety that, at last, impelled her down the stairs. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, she counted, and around her the air was full of whispering, skin-stretched wings. If one of them should touch her again, she must fall. Twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight! The skin of her right hand was torn and hot with blood, for she would never lift it from the wall, only press it down and force her rigid legs to move from the knowledge of each step to the peril of the next. So Caroline came down the dark tower. She could not think. She could know nothing but fear. Only her brain remorselessly recorded the tally. Five hundred and one, it counted. Five hundred and two and three, and four. Sleep tight.